welcome, Simon. Thank you for it. So my apologies in advance that I am a serious energy geek. I try not to um, lose people with my enthusiasm, but just to give you an idea of how en enthusiastic I am about renewable energy. I was in Tasmania last week, and uh, last um, over the weekend I was staying in Pump House Point on Lake St. Clair. I don't know if anyone's seen it, but it's an old pumping station. For, uh, it says Hydroelectric Commission at the top. And on the way to the airport, we stopped by the... Um, uh, I'll remember the name in a second, um, but what what a what a mana dam, which was uh, once upon a time the uh, where the control center for all of Tasmania's grid was, and so that's that's what I like to do uh, on, on my day. I think maybe this is my fourth time I've done an annual review for for lighter footprints. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, I can't tell you everything that happened last year because it was a phenomenal year in the energy system. I'm going to tell you just selected bits, any bits that you heard of and think of missed out on we can address them uh in question time so quick reminder of why we're here this is co2 levels for the last 800,000 years humans arrived around about here 300,000 years ago we learned about burning coal right around here yeah it's a very serious change to our atmospheric concentration as you guys know and we see that reflected in in the temperature this is since 1880 we've already increased a full degree or, or just around a, um, a degree sent above the long-term average. And if we don't start reversing the trend, it will keep going up. Some good news, the CO2 emissions per capita for the planet, for all of us, have started very slightly decreasing. Population is still growing, uh, so emissions are still growing at a slower rate, albeit, but uh, we are reducing the amount of emissions per capita. So that's, that's an early first step. I'm haunted by this quote from McKibben, the founder of 350.org. He says, winning slowly is the same as losing. A bit sobering because I focus on all the little wins that we're making, but I have to acknowledge that to date, we're not winning fast enough. So what do we have to do? Quick recap, we have to replace fossil fuels. What do we replace them with? So Griffith put it very succinctly, we need to electrify everything. And we electrify everything with renewables and those things that we can't electrify, like perhaps making steel or making fertilizer, we make green hydrogen. Fossil fuels were used as a industrial input. We replace that with green molecules or green hydrogen. We're lucky to live in Australia. Once again, we're the lucky country. We've been lucky with so many things, haven't we? With our gold rushes, with wheat, with, uh, with wool, with iron ore, with coal, with gas. Once again, we're lucky with all the critical minerals, whether it's nickel or rare earths or cobalt. Um, Australia has the critical minerals. Uh, we have boundless plains that are windswept and sun drenched. We have site in the ground, the iron ore in the ground. We have everything that is going to be needed for the new revolution, in the next industrial revolution, which is to decarbonize our planet's systems. So Australia should see this as an opportunity, not as a threat. And I think there are signs that that is starting to cut through. So what happened in 2022? Well, not much. I was twiddling my thumbs. But no, what, what happened? Well, it was an amazing year in the energy transition. The first year that the planet spent more than a trillion dollars on the energy transition over yeah over a trillion dollars was invested where did that go about half of it 500 billion was on renewable energy just under 500 billion was on transport mainly electric vehicles and electric buses or electric cars and electric buses um, a growing amount on energy storage and then a bunch of other decarbonization technologies hydrogen is the fastest growing in this set over here but off a very low base. It's still very early days for green hydrogen. So wind and solar are the majority of what's going on in the renewable space. And solar from a slower start than wind is now growing most rapidly of all. And you can see that growth trajectory, the amount of renewables we're installing every year is, is exponential. What's really exciting is that, say, a decade ago, wind and solar were about 30% of investment in new energy, new generation capacity. Now they're making up nearly 80% of all generation that's going in is wind and solar. The world is working out that these are the cheapest technologies and they're overwhelmingly being installed. I'm giving you pluses and minus on the downside. We have seen prices increase for the first time. This trend, downward trend has kicked up in, in some of these technologies as a result of uh, inflation and increased capital costs or interest rates. That is having an effect on the cost of getting projects done, but it's fairly minor. I think it's um, battery prices rose by about 8 or 
last year. So not insignificant, but it unwinds some of the progress uh, that we've done. Hasn't spooked the markets too much yet, but this is just bringing it back to Australia. I've got three lines here. The black is our coal percentage uh, in the grid. The turquoise, or can I call it teal, here is, <laughs> is renewables and gas is uh, the orange color here. So you can see as renewables have gone up, contrary to a lot of commentators' claims, gas hasn't gone up in parallel. In fact, gas is, um, we just had a, a quarter, the, um, the December quarter finished was the lowest gas usage since I think 2004 or 2005. We are using less and less gas for generation every year. Renewables are coming up. Won't be long before these lines cross over and renewables become a greater part of the grid than coal. I think we'll start to see it happen. Uh, well, we actually had one day last year, 21st of November was the very first time, at least in our lifetimes, where renewables generated more power or more energy into uh, the grid than coal on that day. So just one day last year, pretty soon it'll be a week, then a month, and then it'll be full time. You know, hopefully in a decade or so, we'll turn off the last coal power generator. Pushing out fossils, just to show you how um, what's been happening in the grid. In the last 10 years, we've had solar grow by 1,345% in our network, up 20, it's called 28 terawatt hours, which is, kind of like four or five good-sized coal power generators, equivalent of. Wind has pushed out 19.6 terawatt hours, growing by 308%. We've used a tiny bit more hydro than um, a decade ago, but that's just seasonal fluctuation. And you see gas and mainly coal have been pushed out. Very exciting to see that process of solar and the wind going in and the coal and the gas coming out. Just another way of, of visualizing this, this is a visualization I copied from The Guardian in the UK, where they have got a similar one for the greening of the UK's grid. I've got each of the states. This is the last month being January that just passed. I just put a line down here for five years ago. Um, five years ago was about the time that renewables very reliably became cheaper than installing new coal and gas. And you can see I, the darker the green, the more renewables. And you can see that there's been quite a change of pace over this time. Queensland is the furthest behind, but coming up quickly. New South Wales, the same. Victoria is greening up now 40% renewables. Tasmania has always been pretty green. It's only not that's importing uh, brown coal power from Victoria so they can hold back their hydro and then slam that hydro ac across the Bass Strait in the early evening to help us keep the lights on here in Melbourne. And you can see South Australia from a very uh, low renewables grid, very fast trajectory to now they're nearly 80% renewable. It's been quite a phenomenal rise there. Quick look at South Australia. Again, orange is gas. They've had a gas dependent grid for a long time. They phased out their coal in 2016. This is imports, importing from Victoria. It's uh, it's lower than the long-term average, but still around 10% of their power. That They import about 10% of their power and they export about 15. So net balance, they're a net exporter, but they're still, um, as every other state does, relies on its neighbours uh, accessing um, cheaper power at times and keeping the lights on. Uh, the standout success has been the renewables line here, and you can see it grew fast, changed its trajectory, and it's on a nice continuous upward trajectory right now. It keeps growing in South Australia, and they have a target to be net 100% renewable before the end of the decade. It looks like they'll get there a few years early. So around 20, 2016, there was a blackout in South Australia. The response to that was the Finkel Review. Amazing to think it's only been about five and a half years since the Finkel Review was handed down. And in that, a process started in Australia that I've talked about before in this forum, the Integrated System Plan from AEMO. So that's a, every two years, uh, the Energy Market Authority or operator gets, um, well, they're actually, they're working on it continuously. Every two years, they publish um, the latest thinking with all the latest assumptions of the costs, uh, of the advancing of the technical models. And, and they come up with a plan of, of showing where we can go on the best available knowledge. Some people bristle if you say it's a prediction. It's not, it's not a prediction. It's a scenario that looks to be the best of thousands of scenarios tested. Uh, so an increase of storage by a factor of 30 over the next 30 years. Um, grid scale wind and solar to increase by a factor of nine. Down the bottom here, we've got 60% of the coal to be withdrawn by 2030 and 100% by 2043. 
Um, let's see if we can pull that in a decade or so. Basically, every every metric has us going up and to the right, uh, except for coal and gas. It's important at this point to remind uh, that emissions are not just the electricity sector. I focused on electricity a lot, but electricity is only about 30% of our emissions. These, these numbers are um, the latest from, from the Department of Climate Change. These are about four months old, these figures. So electricity is 30%. So we still have a lot of emissions from this area, sometimes called stationary emissions or direct combustion. That's uh, the gas people might have for heating their hot water or gas space heating or industry using gas. Basically, it's when gas is burnt. Transport, so cars, trucks, planes, trains. Agriculture um, from animals and from fertilizer on fields. Fugitive emissions, funny name, but the, it's the gas that's released when you do coal mining or gas processing. It's, it's the gas that's released that you don't bother capturing. It's quite significant, nearly 10% of our emissions. Industrial, things like making fertilizer, you know, industrial processes that use fossil fuels and, and vent off the CO2, and then waste, the gas that comes off our landfills. So we're doing a great job on electricity. We'll talk about that in a second, but we've got to start thinking about all of the other sectors as well. So I just wanted to bring this slide on. We know the science says that we have to reduce emissions from 2005 levels, something like 70 to 80% by somewhere between 2030 and 2035. Let's, let's just call it 80% by 2035, which I believe is Victoria's target right now, which is pretty amazing that we're living in a state that's got a almost science-based target. No, really, when I saw that come out, I thought that policy that was that was announced five years ago, it would have been seen as an extreme Greens policy and uh, anyone asking for it would have been told that they were been playing with the fairies at the bottom of the garden. And here we are with policy approaching science. It's pretty amazing. But if we look at the country, this is the, the federal department's predictions released in about November last year, has emissions reducing by only 20 odd percent from 2005 all the way through to 2035. So we need a very different trajectory. The next slide is even more sobering. I've just broken these down into individual lines. Here's the electricity line. We are doing a great job reducing electricity emissions. It needs to go a bit faster and I'm sure it will. But if you look at all the other lines, I don't need to go through them because they're all the same shape. You see, they're all level. We don't really have an electric vehicle policy in Australia, and it shows. We don't have an agricultural emissions reduction policy, and it shows, and I can go on. So yes, we're doing a great job in electricity, and yes, it's really important, especially as we electrify everything, we depend on low emissions from the electricity sector, but we don't have good strategies in these other sectors. Great thing is if once we stop using fossil fuels, this fugitive sector just disappears. I just want to talk briefly about my, my theory of change. A lot of us have been guilted in the years into, well, you're not really doing what needs to be done unless you're vegan, never fly, wear organic clothing, live in a tent with solar and completely off grid, right? And unless you do all of those things, you're not really doing what needs to be done. I think that's a big fallacy and it's a way of shutting people down. And there's never ending debate between individual action and systemic change. I'm a big believer that what we need to do, all of us, by all means, do what we can in our personal lives to reduce our emissions. And that's, um, I love this analogy I was given. It's a bit like personal hygiene. You know, it's, it's great, you know, great that you had a shower, good on you. Great that you put deodorant on, good on you. Um, but the real work is elsewhere, more than just the housekeeping and that systemic change. And I think that starts with advocacy. In a way, I'm here tonight advocating to you, to an audience that I know is, um, uh, you know, all of you have a natural advocacy bone. That's what you wouldn't be here if, if you weren't. But together we are shaping public opinion. Public opinion um, changes the politics and changes the political will. And we definitely saw that last May. That political will translates into policy, policy into investment. Investment, one's doing a lot of heavy lifting here. Innovation, the costs come down, we create jobs and we have success, we get outcomes. That gives us more confidence that we can achieve. And it gives us more imagination that we can see a future that may have seemed completely out of reach not long ago is, is within reach. And that gives us the confidence to advocate again. And I see this as a virtuous circle that we're all engaged with. We all sit at the center of this and have different ways of interacting 
with this, but this is how we iterate towards solving the big problems that I've showed at the very front. So what a difference a year makes. Last year, I put up this slide, Scott Morrison, Angus Taylor, Barnaby Joyce went to COP26. This was when they went to Glasgow and they went with an empty climate policy and Australia was the pariah. Well, this is only, of course, one emblematic or one iconic photograph of what happened, but we now have a parliament where the majority of MPs want action on climate change and are prepared to vote for it. I think that's worth celebrating. A small geeky thing just to show you the small things that make a difference. This will never be on the front page of the newspaper, but there's this boring thing called the National Electricity Objective. Everything that's done by all of the different market bodies and the regulators and the public servants always has to come back to this, the National Electricity Objective. I won't read it all out. It basically says that at all times they've got to prioritise the affordability, reliability and safety of the electricity network. It says nothing about emissions in it. And we've had this for the last 20 years um, in, in Australia. Well, right now, the energy ministers, well, back in November or December, the energy ministers agreed they want to change this. And there's a consultation, I think just closed the other day, and we're about to see new legislation, which adds this line at the bottom, which includes, they must also take account of the achievement of targets for reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions. So this will now be in the national electricity objective. Um, for the first time, it will actually be an objective to reduce emissions. It's amazing we got so far without it, but these little things matter. Another thing that happened in the last year, uh, I showed this slide last year, this little clipping, uh, it had just happened. Mike Cannon-Brooks and Brookfield, Canadian infrastructure company, had made a takeover bid for AGL. No one knew where it would go. It seemed crazy brave at the time, maybe even a bit more crazy. Well, what happened? It ended up that Mike Cannon-Brooks' Grok Ventures got control of AGL, didn't have to buy as much of it as they thought they would to get control very quickly. Other owners of AGL got in behind and supported the plan, and now AGL's on track to invest $20 billion into renewables over the next 15 years, I believe. Brookfield didn't proceed with that. They proceeded with their own bid for Origin Energy. It hasn't gone through yet, but they plan to buy Origin Energy and invest another $20 billion in that. So we've gone from two of the, well, AGL is the dirtiest company in Australia. Origin must be pretty close behind it. Uh, in one year, both companies are on track for a $40 billion investment uh, in decarbonisation. So much, so much news. Araring, uh, Australia's largest coal power station, announced it's going to close um, seven years before it was thought. So its dates moved from 2032 into this decade. Australia's largest aluminium smelter, which is 10% of New South Wales electricity, has declared that it's going to go 100% um, renewable by 2030. Queensland, stunning. Uh, 18 months ago, the CEO of one of Queensland government-owned coal generators at a conference said something as weak as, I think at one point we might need to think about possibly using a bit less coal. And he was fired within 24 hours. 18 months later, Queensland announces they're going to get out of coal, are going to co close down all of their coal power generators within both mid next decade. And bizarrely, really interestingly, I think uh, the National Party or the Liberal National Party didn't make a peep didn't say a word about it. And I think what that shows you is the politics is changing in Queensland. The LNP know that they can't get control or uh, well, control runs through Brisbane and uh, they won't win Brisbane if they, if they fight against ideas like this. Um, AGL uh, has announced it's going to close Lo Yang about a decade earlier. Victoria announced a 95% renewable energy target by 2035 uh, and an 80% emissions reduction um, target, of, I believe, of the same date. So phenomenal progress in all that. And it's, of course, not just Australia. We're laggards in a lot of ways. Electricity in the grid decarbonisation that we've got some runs on the board and people are looking at us, especially South Australia. They're very impressed with what we're doing. But I find this amazing that China is now investing, is generating more from renewables and growing faster than US and Europe. You know, for a long time, we thought of, uh, of China as being uh, dirty coal, you know, dirty power, lagging technically, but they're right at the pack. Uh, about half of the renewable energy in the world um, is being installed at the moment in China. 
the US passed a, an act, a piece of legislation called the Inflation Reduction Act. I love it. Like who would, who doesn't want to reduce inflation? It's really a, a, a green investment act. It makes a whole lot of investment in whether it's in EVs or um, new wind or solar, all sorts of new technology. It gives them significant tax breaks and subsidies to get projects going and takes the US on their business as usual trajectory of 27% reduction by 2030, puts them on a 40% cut, which is not that far. It's within reach of their Paris cut target of 50%. So it's been a step change in the US. One of the things that's really interesting is this, we're seeing a big part of it is to onshore a lot of manufacturing. So the US was getting concerned with the amount of renewable infrastructure that is manufactured in China. We make the US reliance on Chinese supply chains that they felt uneasy about. The Inflation Reduction Act incentivizes American companies to build that infrastructure here. It's a shame that we don't have any legislation that encourages this massive build out that we saw in those early slides from EMO, it's a shame that we don't have any policy to onshore that, that investment, but I think that's the kind of thing we should start advocating for. I want to give you some good news on electric vehicles. Um, a decade ago, close to zero. Now, 10 million uh, EVs were sold last year. Peak car was 2017. Who would have thought there'd be a point when car sales peaked? Um, the only part of the car market that's growing significantly is the electric part. Bloomberg says that there's really not one electric car market. There are four. There are trucks, cars, scooters, and buses. I'm not going to go through all of these, but exciting figures. 13% of cars sold globally last year were electric. 49% of buses. How's that? basically half of the buses sold in the world. And that's because in, in China, it's pretty much 100% of buses are being sold as electric and massive retrofits to the legacy fleet as well. How about Australia? Well, we are lagging. Everyone knows we're lagging on EVs and it's because we've had no policy, because we have um, policy settings that protect the car industry that closed down five, six, seven years ago. But we do have significant growth. Last year, 3.8% of, of cars in Australia were EVs, nearly double the previous year. So we're growing fast, but we're probably about three years behind the US and five years behind China and about a decade behind Norway. Norway is up around 80%. One thing that's exciting for those who have got range anxiety and are wondering where you're gonna charge these things is the number of charges in Australia is growing rapidly. Um, it's about 50% increase in the number of public charges uh, and in the number of places where you can find one. I've done a lot of driving in an EV, Two, three years ago, some of it was pretty adventurous. Uh, I felt like you, you, you were um, turning up to caravan parks and begging to plug in. There's a lot less of that going on now, but in another year or so at this kind of rate, there'll be almost anything you want to do is going to be covered by fast charging networks. This is a really exciting piece of news that just came out of the US uh, yesterday, it was, that Tesla has reduced the price of their car so that the average Tesla Model 3 is almost $5,000 less than the average car price in the US. So coming out of the showroom, um, driving off the lot, as they, as they call it, and it uh, Tesla is cheaper than the average car purchase in the US. And Bloomberg put this... Um, handy guide together. If you're getting a three-year lease in, in the US, you pay less for a Tesla, $349 a month, than you do for a Toyota Camry LE. Uh, apparently, they're equivalent, equivalent vehicles. So we've got to the point now in the US, not in Australia, but in the US, without subsidies, the subsidies would make, make this more, even more apparent, without subsidies, it's cheaper to buy an electric vehicle. And we all know it's much cheaper to run and are cheaper to um, uh, on the maintenance front, almost no maintenance for, for an EV. So that's a really exciting development. Somewhere around 2025, we'd expect that to be commonplace. I just wanted to give people this as a, something to have in their toolbox. If you talk about EVs, you'll bump into someone, probably a, a, a drunk uncle at a Christmas party who tells you that you know, the problem with EVs is they charge with coal power and they're worse than normal car or you never get the emissions back from them because the batteries use so much. This is some great research out of a reputable group in, in Europe, the Transport and Environment um, NGO. And... This line here is the, the emissions of a um, petrol car over its lifetime, but expressed per kilometer. That there is the um, manufacturing emissions and that is the fuel emissions, that gray bar. Um, obviously depends which country you're in, 
I looked it up and Australia's grid is somewhere between Poland and Germany. Poland's got a filthy grid. Um, Germany's is uh, halfway, halfway between filthy and clean and Australia sits right in the middle. Our grid is still not there. Um, but even at that level, an EV has half the emissions per kilometre than, than a petrol car. And the good thing is it gets cleaner every year because every year our grid decarbonises. Some exciting stuff. Um, I saw this in, in December. This is a blade going off to be tested, the largest wind turbine to be made. It is 115 metres long. It is massive. Some of you might be familiar with the Hepburn wind farm I was involved with. That, those blades are about 40 metres long. So this one is nearly three times as long. Uh, and it's going on a 15 megawatt wind turbine. So I was blown away by this. And then the next month in January, the Chinese, of course, had to outdo <laughs> the, uh, the Danes. I said the other one was 115 metres, right? This is 140 metres. And it's going for an 18 megawatt uh, wind turbine. The previous one I showed you, this one will generate enough power for 20,000 homes. The two turbines in Hepburn combined will do 2,000 homes. So one of these is worth 10 times or 20 times the one that we have at Hepburn Wind. And that's just in a decade, right? That's just it. Um, the technology change is phenomenal. So these are designed for offshore use. This kind of snuck up on me. I um, This is High Wind, uh, which is a Scottish floating offshore wind farm, right? Um, if you'd asked me five years ago, what about offshore wind in Australia? I'd say, well, it's too expensive and we don't have much shallow water. Well, this is a floating wind farm. It can go into water. Um, uh, they believe that all the infrastructure connecting it uh, will work fine in waters up to 800 metres deep. So it'll work anywhere around, basically any, anywhere uh, in any in area of interest around Australia. But what's interesting about this, this project just celebrated its fifth year of operation. This is not new technology being tested. It's five years. And last year, it was the best performing offshore wind farm in the world um, because it's out in the deeper water with better wind. Which brings me to Australia. Um, in the last few years, uh, energy geeks have gone from saying we'll probably never have wind, offshore wind in Australia to actually there being a whole lot of companies looking at offshore wind and starting to peg out where it would be interesting. And there are the, the zones that are under investigation, the Hunter Valley, Illawarra, Gippsland, Northern Tasmania, Portland, uh, Bunbury and Perth uh, are the offshore zones of, of interest. And Gippsland is the first to be officially designated as such. The legislation's there. Uh, it's actually the same authority that does offshore oil rigs. And, you know, is it NOPSEMA? The group that the government department that manages all the offshore leases is managing uh, the leases for offshore wind. And there are four projects here that are um, uh, at various stages of development. Now, who knows whether they'll go ahead or when they'll go ahead, but Star of the South are talking about starting construction in three years. So I hope I hope they do, but it's fascinating that this has moved just in four or five years from being, don't be silly, it'll never make sense in Australia, to uh, people have sunk millions of dollars so far into the studies to work out whether um, this is going to make sense in Australia, and they think that it will. Storage. This is one of the biggest storage farms in the world, battery farms. And it's just down, um, just before you get to Geelong, I think it's in Moorabool, the Moorabool Victorian Big Battery, it's called. Uh, and it's about three times the size of the big battery in South Australia that we've all heard so much about. So this is the biggest battery you've never heard of. This nondescript facility, Tesla built, they just finished it in December, I believe, and it took them 15 months to build it. And it can crank out batteries like those ones I showed you. Sorry, like each of these little container ones here. It can crank those out one every 68 minutes. Um, I did a quick calculation. A factory of this size could, in a year, produce as much batteries as Australia is going to need over the next decade. Yeah, the question is, why are we not setting up these kind of factories in Australia and supplying all of Australia, but also our, our neighbours in more populous countries nearby? Back to big opportunities, big opportunities for Australia. It's big wind, big EV, big storage, big opportunities. Critical minerals. Someone um, gave me a great visualization saying that if, if there was a creator, then the creator tripped over and spilt the periodic table all over Australia. 
we've got everything. We've got rare earth minerals. We've got nickel. We've got bauxite. We've got iron ore. We've got all the critical minerals that are needed for the energy transition. We often hear about appalling working conditions uh, in the Congo for cobalt mining. We have cobalt deposits. We also have spoils piles up in Mount Isa um, that have got high concentrations of cobalt in them. It just wasn't valuable when the primary metal was first extracted from that ore. Green hydrogen, I talked a fair bit about this last year, but just a reminder of the kind of projects that people are talking about. This is a huge project. That's to scale on the map. It's a big project, but it would be the biggest generator in the world, bigger than the Three Gorges Dam in China, bigger than the Taupu Dam in, in Brazil. And it would be a combination of wind, which drops down during the day and comes up at night, and solar. So it has a fairly even average um, generation profile. And its intention is that it would produce a large amount of hydrogen, green hydrogen, which would be used for fertilizer production and export in ammonia form and green steel production. Uh, speaking of green steel, here's the hybrid plant in Sweden. Volvo produced this mining vehicle using steel from that plant. It's completely fine steel. It works. It's good. It's as good as, uh, as, as the other stuff, but it's also fossil free. And it's here now. Now, this is a relatively small plant, um, but what's really exciting is this is happening in Sweden. It's a bit of a shame it's not happening here, but we have so many advantages. We have access to much cheaper energy they do to make the green hydrogen that goes into making the steel. Um, we have access to the iron ore. We have everything. We're a much bigger economy. We have everything that they have, except I guess they had a political system that committed to this R&D a decade ago while we were twiddling our thumbs. So I um, hope that we can get on and do projects like this. So back to Bill McKibben. I'm in the home stretch now. Winning slowly is the same as losing. Yep, he's, he's absolutely right. Um, we are winning slowly, but I want to make the point, I want to make the case, I think I have made the case that we are accelerating and that there is some light at the end of the tunnel. I just wanted to give you one chart to show you. This is predictions from um, the energy market operator's rapid transformation scenario in 2015. And I'm sorry it's small, you'll see why in a second, but this is coal reducing at a rapid rate according to the energy market operator in 2015. And this is fast growth, growth of renewables and this is how much solar, so how much storage they thought we'd need. It's not exactly zero, but it is pretty close to it. So this is a rapid transition scenario from 2015, just seven years ago. Okay, this is what they released last year. This is renewables. So we've gone off that trajectory to this one. It, we're down phasing out, and I think it'll phase out faster than that. And they now see a significant role for storage. They believe this is absolutely possible. And now I've seen that Tesla battery factory, uh, I do too. So some of you have seen this slide before. This is New York Fifth Avenue in 1900. If you look, if you were able to see this closely, I'm sorry, it's probably hard to see from where you're sitting. There's one car in this photo. Where's the car? There's one car in there. 13 years later, where's the horse? There's one horse there, the rest are cars. In 13 years, a hell of a lot can happen. And I showed you how much is happening in the last seven or eight years. Um, and imagine another six or seven years from now, we are starting to win. Uh, well, we are winning and we're starting to win faster and we're accelerating. And I'll just leave this up while I do questions where hopefully people can think about what I think is this virtuous circle, all the different places that you can put yourself to help accelerate this virtuous circle. Thank you very much. Thanks, Simon. Um, I was a little remiss. I do want to uh, acknowledge there's some councillors here tonight. So we've got Deputy Mayor Lisa Hollingsworth. We've got Councillor Susan Bigger and Councillor Wes Holt. So thank you. All right. We're going to move into Q&A now. We've got Richard Heading and Ken Parker who are going to uh, convene the, the question time with Simon. So over to you guys. Simon, first, and look, we've had a lot of questions come through on Slido. Um, forgive us if we don't get to all of them, but we've tried to sort of group the themes together. So hopefully your questions will be at least partly answered. Um, first one is around um, sort of storage and transmission. Simon, has Victoria got enough storage in the pipeline to get up to high levels of renewables? And how long do you think it'll take to get there? 
Yeah, I was, I was actually I was talking with um, um, Dylan McConnell. Some of you might might know him. He's um, he's one of Australia's gurus on on the energy transition. Talking with him about this just yesterday. Are we are we building storage at the pace that the energy transition requires? Um, and uh, he went away for a few hours and came back and said and, and looked at looked at what's happening. And yes, we are we are building at the rate that. Um, at those predictions that you saw that you saw there. In fact, we're probably building a little bit fast, faster than that. What's exciting is um, like um, rooftop solar is, is fascinating in that the vast majority of solar in Australia is sitting on people's roofs. Yes, we have an, a utility solar, you know, these big solar farms. We have, we have those and they're growing fast, but our rooftop solar is unmatched of any country in the world. Um, and we're seeing the same with batteries as well that there is more, more storage sitting in people's garages than there is storage sitting in these massive battery farms. It's, it's um, not as extreme. Uh, it's probably, um, maybe it's two to, a factor of two to one, uh, and maybe, maybe that'll change over time. But uh, we, we have a significant amount of storage in Australia. And don't forget, we also have um, pumped hydro. There are three existing pumped hydro plants that were built in, um, in the 1970s. And uh, and we're uh, having um, some troubles, but moving ahead with building the Snowy Hydro project, which um, might come up later. So yeah, we're 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 on track. Um, we could always do more, but it, the the market responds to demand, and um, at the moment, uh, you know, there there is sufficient demand, and it's pu pulling through um, pulling through the installations. Thanks, Richard. Now, uh, new fossil fuel power is obviously controversial, but Bruce Mountain has recently said that uh, it's likely that new gas and coal will be needed to tide us through the transition. What do you think? Oh, I didn't see those comments from Bruce, and I agree with him on um, on a very large amount of what he what he what he says. I wonder if he means um, new gas and coal power stations, or does he mean um, turning up existing plants? I'm not sure. What um, the AMO's modeling says that we need about um, about 10 gigawatts of gas through to 20, I think 2040. Um, and we have about 10 gigawatts of gas, but it's, um, but some of the plants we have are very old and they're also a type that doesn't like the, um, to ramp up and down quickly. So some of our gas infrastructure will need to be refreshed. Um, that's on current modeling. I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing storage reducing the amount um, of, of gas uh, and other technologies um, coming in like pumped hydro, uh, maybe, um, maybe other you know, long-term storage technologies that, that, that will come in. But um, yeah, we, we, see the, we see the role of gas at around about, um, it's around about 6% of the uh, uh, national electricity market right now, trending downwards. Uh, I don't expect that to increase. Um, and certainly I would be surprised if um, Bruce thought that coal was going to increase. We're not, we're definitely not gonna build any new coal power stations in Australia. Thanks so much, Richard. Look, probably another one related to the grid. And the question is, does the grid need a significant upgrade given the growth in distributed generation and storage. So that's things like rooftop solar. And what about the coordination of these distributed generation? How can this best be managed? So yeah, a huge topic there, good, good questions. Does the grid need upgrading? Um, we are, we're constantly upgrading the grid. Um, remember, I think people might remember the phrase, we. Um, used a lot a decade or two ago of smart grids. We'd have, one day we'd have these amazingly, um, we'd have smart grids. Well, the smart grids already starting to happen. Uh, some Anyone in this room on, on um, Amber Electric, um, uh, which is a, a retailer that allows you to, uh, you, you pay the market price for your electricity. Um, so you, people, a lot of people who are on, um, on Amber will charge their uh, electric vehicle or change their hot water system to, um, to draw from the grid when electricity is cheap and um, uh, and not when electricity is expensive. Uh, smart meters, it, if, if in Victoria, you know, almost every house has a smart meter. That's a piece of smart grid technology. Um, it, was a, it was a 
big cost, a big upgrade, uh, but we're seeing the grid upgraded all, all the time. Big part of the reason why we saw massive increases in electricity costs in the first decade of this, this century was um, increased domestic loads that were coming um, from um, more high, people's higher expectations of reliability and much higher use of air conditioning in Australia put um, demands on a lot of um, upgrades of the distribution network. So we, so we saw that. Now, coordination. I think coordination is fascinating uh, in that uh, with, with electric vehicles, if everyone comes home at night and plugs in at the same time as they turn their air conditioner on and cook their dinner, it's going to be the worst thing that ever happened for the grid. But if the, uh, if the electric vehicles subscribe to a service that tops them up when electricity is cheap uh, and moves, uh, and, and also you could top it up when electricity is greener than um, you know, when, the, when the wind's blowing or the sun's shining, then um, we can actually get a lot more out of our grid. We can we can get a lot more energy over the same grid. And I think there'll be companies, a significant number of companies that will offer services like that, that will make our, um, uh, our appliances without us having to worry about them. We'll get the same service out of our appliances, um, just like with electric hot water systems that heat uh, in off-peak times. We'll get that with, um, with many other appliances. They won't require us to do anything. But together, uh, that coordination is is good for the grid, good for emissions, and helps consumers get the lowest cost energy. Simon, uh, a fairly general question: uh, What should we ask our federal and state politicians to do as high priority regarding the energy transition? Yeah, good good questions. Well. Overriding, we need we need higher emissions reduction targets. Um, uh, we need to see emissions reduction policies in other sectors, not just electricity. Uh, to, to a large degree, the energy transition in the electricity sector is going to take care of itself. The economics are fundamentally on the side of decarbonisation, so it's going to happen. Um, it will need government intervention to make sure that uh, th that it's done in a in an ordered way rather than a um, chaotic uh, just way, but we still end up at the same low. We, we know where we're going. We don't have good strategies strategies in Australia for a lot of the other sectors. So I think we should be lobbying our, um, our MPs for working on those. Um, I'd love to see some more some more R and D. Australia, uh, we we have um, we have all the ingredients to come together to be making green steel. Um, but it's crazy that we are shipping our iron ore offshore and shipping our coal offshore for people to turn that iron ore into steel and sell it back to us as cars and dishwashers, um, where, where, where the, the inputs all came from Australia in the first place. Simon, uh, dealing with solar panels and batteries at end of life is often raised as an issue. What are your thoughts on this and the potential for recycling? Yeah, it's so a fun stat about uh, about solar. The average solar panel um, uh, in Australia is three years old. Right? It's because it's growing so growing so quickly, and the average solar panel um, will will be generating in twenty five years time. Now, um, some will come off early, some will go on um, will will go on longer. But panels that are being produced now um, are likely to, to be in perfect working order, probably ten percent lower generation in twenty five years. But we will start to see an increase, increasing amount of, um, uh, of, of waste coming from it. I saw a report um, last year, I was looking at this, only about 1% of e-waste, electronic waste, like our computers, printers, flat screen TVs, our old cathode ray TVs, only 1% of e-waste is um, solar panels right now. So it's a, it's a very, you know, it, it's a small part of a significant problem. Victoria is leading the way in making sure that people don't put e-waste into landfill. Um, it, it, it has to be managed. Uh, and there are a number of uh, government sponsored programs to start building the capability of, of solar panel recycling in Australia. There are solar panel recycling companies um, in, uh, in Europe. I, I haven't looked in, in the US yet, but they're looking at recovery rates, um, you know, get it, getting 95 to 99% of um, the material out of the solar panels uh, that can be used again for other, other usages. Um, and uh, lithium batteries are also, um, that there are 
existing methods and um, uh, in the, especially in the automotive space, there, there, is, uh, there are plans for recycling of those batteries. The lithium batteries you have in your laptop and mobile phone and all of those electronics, there's a very low recovery rate or low recycling rate of those because every one of them, you know, there are so many thousands of different makes and models, whereas in cars, it's much simpler and they're um, much more practical to recycle. So I'm, I'm not particularly worried about those. Um, there's certainly an immense pressure on uh, regulators, uh, on industry to deal with the problem. And I think we should keep that pressure on. Um, but but it's it, it's it's definitely a solvable problem and in some places a solved problem. Simon, you have mentioned hydrogen. What are your thoughts on hydrogen as an alternative fuel source? Yeah, so hydrogen's not really a fuel source, but a fuel storage mechanism. Right? You, there's nowhere on the well, I think there are couple of gas fields somewhere in the world where there's a tiny percentage of, of hydrogen, but, but basically all hydrogen um, needs to be produced. And we produce it either through uh, cracking gas, which lets CO2 off into the atmosphere, and that's how most hydrogen is produced in the world right now, or we can produce it by cracking water, where the only thing you get off it is hydrogen and, and oxygen. Um, uh, it's, there, there's a lot of good things about hydrogen when used as a fuel, the only um, the only output you get is water. Um, I, I went with a, a friend of a friend has a um, one of the few hydrogen vehicles in Victoria. There was, last year, I think there are only about six of these cars, and he took me for a drive in it. And um, uh, out the back of the car, he's got the second model. In the first model, it used to drip water all the way behind it as it went. And um, people, celebrities, didn't like you know turning up to the red carpet and there being a little dribble behind the car. <laughs> So in the new model, there's a flush or, or a dump button. So you push the button and the car does a little wee. In um, theory, there's a lot of nice things about, uh, about a hydrogen car. You can um, fill it up relatively quickly. At the moment, there are only two hydrogen fueling stations in Australia and um, no hydrogen car has enough. One's in Melbourne, one's in Canberra, and no car has the range to go between the two. Um, <laughs> Uh, of course, that can all be changed, and we once would have said the same thing about electric vehicles. But I think the, the killer is the running cost is about three times as much as electric, um, and you can plug an electric you can plug an electric car in at home, and that's what most people the way most people do most of their charging. They get home, plug it in, and don't even think about it. Whereas um, hydrogen, no one will ever have a filling station at home. It's um, it's really sophisticated and pretty um, dangerous kit. So I. I I think most people in, in the energy space recognize that hydrogen's got a, a small number of uses for um, a, as a fuel, fewer and fewer in cars. We used to think oh, it'll definitely do trucks, but I think we're gonna start seeing more and more battery trucks. Um, uh, there's even talk of battery trains and um, uh, battery short haul flights. But for long haul flights, for shipping, um, uh, for remote areas. Some of those are big uses. Some of them are pretty small uses. I think we'll see hydrogen used as a carrier of energy. The energy will come from renewables um, and uh, we'll see it as a carrier. But hydrogen's biggest use, the, there's one of the biggest uses of hydrogen in the world right now is to produce fertilizer and it's produced by cracking gas. Um, there's a huge market for hydrogen. For, for If we decide that we don't want to have polluting um, manufacture of fertilizer and we want to have green production, then there's a huge market for green hydrogen just for that. And Australia is in a great position to produce it um, for uh, explosives as well. Uh, a, a lot of um, ammonia, which could come from green hydrogen and lots of industrial processes that rely on fossil fuel. We will be able to green them up, especially steel production, maybe some chemical synthesis. We will be able to use hydrogen for, for those. So don't think of hydrogen as a way of pushing your car around town. Um, think of it as a way of decarbonizing uh, processes that rely on fossil fuels. So it'll play an important role, but it's not, um, it's not going to be the biggest role. Simon, just moving on, on the, the vehicle again, what needs to be done to develop a meaningful electric vehicle strategy? Good, good question. So lots, lots is being done on a piecemeal basis around around the country. Like one of one of the you know, boring bits of, of work to be done is making sure that public buildings and apartment 
blocks have charging infrastructure in the in the basement. I've heard from so many people who uh, who say that if, you know, they they live in a live in a high rise building, um, they have a parking spot, but they can't get it. The body corporate won't let them put a charger in, or it's prohibitively expensive. Now, if it's pre wired, uh, it, it, then it's then it can be made much simpler to do so. Um, so. Uh, boring stuff like planning regulations. There's a good program in Victoria called um, Charging the Regions, where the state government has looked for all the charging black spots in the state. Um, two years ago, I drove from um, Eden in the south coast of New South Wales around Gippsland um, uh, through Sale to Melbourne. And there's um, a round of um, uh, Malakuta around around that area. There was a there was a charging black spot, and I had to pull into a caravan park and beg beg the guy to let me charge for a few hours. So I could get onto Bensdale without another charger. Now that's all there's that's all being changed with Victoria's you know, like like the government did with black spots and mobile phones. They're doing the same thing with black spots with charging facilities. So that's that's coming. Um, one of the things. Well, we saw that example where in the US, it's just at the point where EVs are, um, are, are cheaper off the lot than, um, than, than, a, than the average car. Um, still not cheap enough um, for a lot, of, a lot of Americans, and we're a few years before where they're going to be cheap enough for, for most Australians as well. But long before they're cheaper off the lot, they're cheaper on the lifetime ownership. Um, in, I, I talked to an um, uh, a, a energy expert in the ACT government, they've moved over to, uh, I think 100% of their fleet purchases now are EVs, and they found that EVs over a three-year lease is cheaper for them than if they were to lease. Uh, um, but it took them a lot of wrangling of the fleet company to do so. Now that they've done, now that they've done that, everyone else who uses SG Fleet, which is you know, a huge leasing company, will now benefit from the government having beaten the path there. So uh, moving government fleets across and helping people soften the blow of buying the car up front would, would make a huge difference. Uh, even if people were to, to you know, pay that back in, in their fuel savings over three, four, five years, a lot of people could get into an EV a lot sooner. Um, but there's lots, lots of programs around the country. Um, there's still some, uh, we, we still have some holdovers from the car protection era. We, we, we had protectionism to protect our, our, our car era, the, the luxury car tax. And there's, there's still some elements of that that are, um, that, that are broken where uh, some, cars, some cars that are not fuel efficient get discounts um, uh, that, sh that shouldn't. And we should switch the levels so that EVs get uh, the discounts and, and the other cars that are less efficient don't. Julia would like to know the relative importance of the two issues. One is the insufficient technology to solve the energy and environmental problems of climate change versus the politics and vested interests that get in the way of that. In other words, uh, the sort of issues of open government and the influence of lobbyists and donors and so on. Well, I think the second is much more important. We, we have the technologies for solving about 80% of the emissions problem. Maybe maybe it's more um, report. I read that in is probably three years old. Um, somewhere between 80 and 90% of the emissions problem, we already have the technology. Uh, those technologies will, will become cheaper and more efficient and smaller and um, lower materials input uh, as, as we build more of them. But we, we're not sitting here waiting for technology to, to solve these problems. What we, what we need is this cycle without the political will being destroyed by those lobbyists that Julia was referring to. Um, uh, that's, that's the issue that we need. We need a um, political system that works for the people, uh, need a political system that listens to the people, not to factions or lobbyists or um, uh, vested interests that want to slow this circle down. Great, thank you. I hope we can address that later in the year, Richard. Simon, uh, what are your thoughts on shutting down of coal and gas exports? Um, that would reduce far more CO2 than Australia's domestic emissions. Yeah, it's a really, it's a really good question. Um, so Australia produces, exports about four times as much 
poll as we as we use and um i think a similar factor for for gas we are um uh, one of the world's largest fossil fuel exporters. We we were the number one gas for a little while. Um, the US has just uh, taken the number one position, which is going to be fascinating because when we went from being uh, a gas island to gas exporter, our gas price went up massively um, and it pushed our energy transition along very quickly with gas going up. The US has been swimming in cheap gas for the last decade. And it's about, they you know, saw some uh, reporting saying that within two or three years, they we, we can expect gas prices in the US to start increasing and that'll push their transition along significantly. But um, yeah, should we, um, uh, should we be worried about about Australia's gas and coal exports? D definitely. I mean, there's there's always the drug dealer's defence, which is if I didn't sell it to them, someone else would. Um, I don't buy the go the government, current and previous, said that Australian coal is cleaner. Um, therefore, we should sell. You know, it's sort of like saying my heroin's better than their heroin. Um, I actually think that our uh, our coal heroin we we can't actually. Um, demonstrate that it is significantly cleaner. I think that's something we've, we've told ourselves, but as, as far as the amount of pollution that comes off uh, out of it when it's burnt, um, uh, I, I don't think a convincing scientific case has been, has been made on that. Um, one of the things we really have got to do, I think that's a, a step before that, is we've got to stop opening new coal and gas facilities. Um, um, Climate 200, uh, which is my other hat, which I'm not going to talk about much much tonight, but um, we're very engaged in the New South Wales election and people keep saying, um, well, is New South Wales great on climate? Matt Keane's doing such a great job. He's doing a great job on, on electricity. He's doing a great job on renewables. But since the Paris Agreement was signed, New South Wales has opened 26 coal and gas facilities. They're making the problem worse. Um, They've uh, approved the... the um, Narrabri gas project recently and, and uh, are now in the process of pushing through a gas pipeline through the Liverpool plans. So Australia does have to start phasing down its, um, its, its coal and gas exports. It's important that, um, that demand for them for it is also reduced worldwide. But the biggest thing I think we've got to do is stop pouring petrol on the fire by opening new coal and gas facilities. I'll just combine uh two questions here. Um, one is Greg's wanting to know, uh, say that the focus has been on electricity, including converting transport and uh, burning of fuels, but how do we deal with industrial emissions? And the other question to go with it uh, at your discretion is, what are the top three barriers to, the ch to change that are needed? And has this changed since you were first involved in re renewable energy? Come back to that second one. <laughs> Had a little time to think on that one, but on on industrial well, industrial emissions are many faceted. Um, for let's say steel, we know how to make green steel. We instead of using coal in blast furnaces, um, we um, can use a direct reduction of iron method using hydrogen as the reducer as the re the, the reductant. Um, uh, it's been demonstrated, and there's you know, functional plants in Sweden that that are doing this. For, um, for concrete or for cement making, I visited a plant in, in Belgium in 2019. I visited um, the uh, Calix has, has a um, plant there. It's actually an Australian company, developed its technology in Bacchus Marsh of all places. Um, and unfortunately, when they were getting ready to commercialise, uh, they couldn't get a grant from the government and they, um, uh, and they needed a carbon price. And at the same time, they were lured with a grant from the EU and a carbon price to Belgium. So that's an Australian technology that went off shore. So that they have they have a technology for taking the um, the, the main source of CO two out of cement production. For um, uh, other industrial processes like glass, glass making needs needs high heat. Um, we can get very high heat, um, but um, from from uh, um, electrical elements they can get electrical elements up to about 1600 degrees um, for special purposes but sometimes it's not quite enough for some processes uh, in which case that's a good that's a good use for hydrogen 
So there are many, many different industrial processes, as you can imagine, um, and um, the different ways of electrifying them. Um, again, use use green electrons where possible, and when um, you run out of green electron opportunities, you use green molecules, being hydrogen or its derivatives. Simon, uh, what is your elevator speech, 22nd pitch, to respond to human-caused climate change deniers? I... I, I actually enjoy speaking with um, with with climate change deniers, and the game I play this is a game. Um, the game I play is try to find the first point of departure. Like, um, don't talk about. You know, they they want to approach you and say solar panels um, never pay off the energy that goes into them, which is wrong. A solar panel pays off its energy it goes into it in about a year, um, or, uh, or and wind turbines about six months. They, they, they'll pick some crazy factor that's just wrong. Um, as soon as I've established, you know, I've asked them whether they accept the science of climate change, and they often find that confronting. Um, but if they uh, if they're up for a com if they're up for a serious con conversation, if if they're not up for a conversation, like don't bother. But if they are, start at the beginning. Um, do you accept that uh, that humans have raised the CO two in the atmosphere by fifty percent since the beginning of the industrial revolution? And if they don't believe that, then You've actually got a disagreement over a fact. Mm -hmm. um, so that conversation, then you can move. Um, uh, do you agree that CO2 is a greenhouse gas? Um, there's probably about, yeah, about a progression of questions questions like, like this. Um, I mean, it, re it, re it really depends on why they're, on what they're opposing. Um, I mean, it's a smarter, um, but smarter communicators who are, who are actually trying to change people's mind will, will, um, uh, will focus on um, the economic opportunities, perhaps, uh, or um, clean air for uh, for their children. Or, um, but um, maybe I'm not as strategic as that. I sort of enjoy trying to find out. And when, when someone genuinely disagrees with you, and they're prepared to go on that journey of what what's the first point of departure? What's the first thing that we disagree on? Um, that can be quite that could be quite fun and rewarding for both people. So that's that's how I approach it. Okay, everybody, we'll have to um, stop there. I'd like to um, say thank you very much to Simon for coming along tonight.